In the Planescape campaign setting for D&D, there are 17 outer planes, which are essentially the realms of D&D's afterlife. There's one plane for each moral alignment, ranging from chaotic good to lawful evil to true neutral. I've started a series of covering each plane in depth, and I've already done the lawful evil plane, the Nine Hells of Beator. In this video, I'll be telling you everything you need to know about the Seven Heavens of Mount Celestia. For my Planescape videos, I primarily base them off of the original Planescape books for AD&D 2nd edition, but where there's interesting details included in other editions of d and I'll talk about those too. However, I've found that there isn't all that much material on Mount Celestia in later editions, but if I miss something from other editions, you'll have to forgive me. I mostly use 2nd edition because I figure it's best to use the original Planescape books, and the Planescape campaign setting only existed in 2e, at least until recently. It got discontinued going into 3rd edition. All of the places in the Planescape campaign setting remained, but dedicated Planescape books were no longer published, and so in my opinion, the theme and the unique charm of Planescape was largely lost. The Planescape campaign setting was revived in October 2023 for 5th edition, but the box set hardly provides any information at all on Mount Celestia, or really any of the Outer Plains aside from the Outlands. And as always for my videos, the Planescape campaign setting and D&D in general is rife with words that people disagree how to pronounce. I try my hardest to find the best pronunciations, but I'm not always successful. So if I pronounce anything in a way that you don't like, forgive me. Mount Celestia is the plane of lawful good. Lawful and good are terms that can mean different things depending on what edition of D&D we're talking about, and of course, who the DM is. In the very first installment of D&D in 1974, there was one axis alignment, and that was the Law-Chaos axis. This first version of alignment also had other differences to how we think of alignments today, if we even use it at all, as many DMs don't like alignment, or they only use it for NPCs and not for players. The first version wasn't really a sliding scale ranging from very lawful to very chaotic with everything in between. Instead, a character would have one of three alignments, lawful, chaotic, or neutral. In the 1977 basic set, two-axis alignment was introduced, adding the good-evil scale, though it still was a bit more simple than the two-axis alignment that would come later, with there just being lawful good, lawful evil, chaotic good, chaotic evil, and neutral. One interesting thing that I found in this book is that each alignment has a language and a set of hand signals and body motions that all other creatures of that same alignment know. So if you meet another character that speaks another language than you, but you're both lawful good, then you can still communicate with each other. But if you're lawful good and they're lawful evil or some other alignment, then you can't. D&D used two-axis alignment up until the basic rulebook released in 1981 which went back to using one-axis alignment. In that book, lawful is made out to be essentially the same thing as good, and chaotic is essentially the same thing as evil. That book retains alignment languages, but now there's just three of them, lawful, chaotic, and neutral. Then, when ad and 2nd edition came out in 1989, it used two-axis alignment once again. And that's the edition of D&D that Planescape was made for. 3rd edition kept two-axis alignment, but then 4th edition in 2008 changed it again. Now, alignment was on a sort of one-axis scale that combined and simplified the features of the two-axis scale. There were only five possible alignments. Lawful good, good, evil, chaotic evil, and unaligned. Good essentially meant neutral good, and evil meant neutral evil. Unaligned basically meant true neutral, but it was slightly different. So there was no such thing as chaotic good or lawful evil. It's very similar to the original alignment system, as all lawful creatures are good and all chaotic creatures are evil. Despite this, 4th edition de-emphasized alignment, especially compared to the olden days where your race dictated your alignment. Because now you could be unaligned. So having an alignment at all was a choice. 5th edition is a bit interesting, because it simultaneously continues the trend of 4th edition and harkens back to 2nd edition. It returns the two-axis system, but it also, just like 4th edition, de-emphasizes alignment by not including alignment requirements for spells, items, and races, like those earlier editions had. But in 5th edition, unlike 4th edition but similar to earlier editions, being unaligned is reserved for unintelligent monsters and animals, 
it means you aren't capable of making moral choices, not that you have chosen no sides. So what exactly do law and good mean in D&D? Law is about believing that order is a vital force of the universe. The definition of law is a bit looser in AD&D 2nd edition, which I'll alternatively call just 2nd edition, than it is in 3rd edition. Strength comes from unity and organization. Law is more about collectivism, while chaos is more about individualism. Law is having a code. In 3rd edition, it's about truth, honor, and keeping your word. It's also about respecting authority and upholding tradition. Good is also a bit different from addition to addition. Second edition describes a good character as one who is honest, charitable, and forthright. This edition also relies heavily on cultural moral relativism, which to my eye kind of defeats the concept of alignment a little bit. For instance, think of one culture that considers child sacrifice to their patron deity to be good, and another that considers killing innocents to be evil. If a child sacrificer leaves that first society on a visit to the second society, does their alignment suddenly change? Or do they remain good even though the society they're in deems their actions to be evil? It all seems a bit silly. That being said, there are things that I appreciate about AD&D's good-evil spectrum. For instance, in this edition, evil is more about selfishness than it is about actively hurting people. Though if people get hurt in the pursuit of their goals, evil characters don't mind. In 3rd edition, however, goodness means having a respect for life, being altruistic, and having a concern for the dignity of sentient beings. It's about making personal sacrifices to help others. 3rd edition's alignment is interesting because it raises the bar for what it takes to be both good and evil. Evil implies hurting, oppressing, and killing others. Maybe you'll see what I mean better if I read you what neutrality means in 3rd edition. People who are neutral with respect to good and evil have compunctions against killing the innocent, but lack the commitment to make sacrifices to protect or help others. Neutral people are committed to others by personal relationships. A neutral person may sacrifice himself to protect his family or even his homeland, but he would not do so for strangers who are not related to him. I really like this definition of neutrality. It makes it quite clear that 99% of people would not be considered good, but rather would be neutral. The good are the exceptional few, and that's important to keep in mind, because it's hard to be good enough for Mount Celestia, though this kind of altruistic goodness is definitely more common in D&D than it is in the real world. So, a lawful good character is one that believes the world can be made into a better place for all through a well-ordered society. They believe that when laws are just and respected, everyone prospers, and that good behavior can be promoted through law. They strive to bring the greatest benefit to the most people while causing the least amount of harm. They value justice as well as mercy. They believe that the powerful must protect the weak and that discipline and hard work is needed to combat evil. Paladins are often exemplars of what it means to be lawful good, and Mount Celestia is full of such creatures. Mount Celestia is the ideal model of justice, kindness, purity, and order. It's the place for the virtuous to achieve perfection honestly and diligently, and to help others achieve perfection as well. It is a place of joy and harmony, but it's also a place of discipline and austerity. If you're looking for a place to simply enjoy life, you're better off going to Arborea or Elysium. Mount Celestia demands more of you than that. No matter how good you are, it asks that you try to be better. The reward for coming better is twofold. You're granted a higher rank, transformed into a better, more powerful creature, and you're given access to the next higher layer of the plane, where your joy will be heightened, but so will your responsibilities. And while Mount Celestia is a beautiful place, it can also be quite dangerous, and life there can be quite hard, especially on some of the upper layers. There are avalanches, rock slides, storms, and violent winds that make flying difficult, unless you're an archon. Mount Celestia is a radiant mountain of unfathomable height jutting out from an infinite sea. Each of its layers is at once a mountain or series of mountains, as well as a higher point on the one great mountain that is Mount Celestia as a whole. Each layer beyond the first is shrouded in a fog or mist that prevents you from seeing it from below, but the light emanating from the highest heaven is so great that it pierces through, always visible to those who look always serving as inspiration and motivation to stay true to your path so that one day you'll reach the top. At the top of each layer is a portal leading to the next, 
but the portals are guarded by archons who ensure that only the worthy may pass. In fact, reaching the portals is already quite the feat. You can climb for years and years and still be no closer to reaching the next gate. That's partially because each layer is infinite, but also because the path you must take is as much metaphorical or spiritual as it is physical. Like how Beator takes much inspiration from Dante's Inferno, Mount Celestia takes inspiration from Dante's Paradiso, or Paradise. However, Dante's heaven has nine layers ascending to God, and the abode of God is the tenth layer, but Mount Celestia only has seven, but those seven match Dante's first seven fairly well. The layers are Lunia, Mercuria, Venia, Solania, Mertian, Jovar, and Cronius, or Cronius. The layers or spheres of Dante's paradise are the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the stars, the prima mobile, and the empyrean. The name Lunia is taken from the word lunar, and it is a layer of moonlight. Mercuria is obviously related to Mercury and Venia to Venus. Solania comes from sol, meaning sun. Mertian is reminiscent of the word Martian or Mars. Jovar comes from Jove, which is another name for the god Jupiter. And Cronius comes from Cronus or Kronos, the Greek god whose Roman name is Saturn. The spheres of Dante's paradise are also pretty similar to Mount Celestia's realms in what they represent. The moon is for the inconstant, those who are good in life but deficient in the virtue of fortitude, and Lunia is a place for those who are good but have far to go. Mercury is for the ambitious, those who are deficient in the virtue of justice, and Mercuria is a place of ambition as well. Venus is for the lovers, those who are deficient in the virtue of temperance, and Venia is a bit of a layer of earthly comforts. The sun is for the wise, those who sufficiently displayed the virtue of prudence, and Solania is a layer of enlightenment. Mars is for the warriors of the faith, those who sufficiently displayed the virtue of fortitude, and Mertian is a layer of militarism. Jupiter is for the just rulers, those who sufficiently displayed the virtue of justice, and Jovar is a place where wisdom and action are in balance. And Saturn is for the contemplatives, those who sufficiently displayed the virtue of temperance. And Tronius is for those who've achieved complete self-actualization. Of course, a major difference between Dante's Paradise and Mount Celestia is that in Paradise, your good deeds in life land you in one of the spheres of heaven, where in Mount Celestia, your good deeds generally land you in Lunia, but you work your way up, improving upon yourself, learning and displaying higher virtue with each step up. And of course, Mount Celestia isn't just based on Dante's paradise. It takes inspiration from Eastern religion as well. There are many paths that wind their way up Mount Celestia's slopes from layer to layer. The paths are as much physical trails as they are spiritual journeys. Most who come to the seven heavens eventually choose a path, though there's nothing stopping you from deciding to remain in the first layer all your days. When you choose a path, you swear an oath to a patron usually a deity, but sometimes just another pilgrim or archon who has progressed further along the path than you. You undertake a vigil and a fast, you offer a sacrifice, and then you begin, following that path until you reach the next layer. From there, you can choose to stay on your path, or choose a different one. Each path is essentially a list of virtues that you swear to follow and to perfect. And of course, each path is also a distinct physical trail up the mountain. The Eightfold Path requires that you practice patience, pacifism, courage, joy, discipline, generosity, kindness, and teaching others. The Path of Five Virtues asks for complete honesty, charity, hope, moderation, and tolerance. Followers of this path rarely progress beyond the sixth layer. The Path of Valor demands that you perform good deeds every day. Followers of this path rarely progress beyond the fifth layer. The path of renunciation requires constant charity to anyone who asks it, poverty, meaning you must beg for your meals and lodging, and mortification of the flesh, in whatever form you choose, such as fasting, an oath of silence or chastity, or self-flagellation. The path of mystic union is about meditation, cleansing, emptiness, fasting, and seeking visions. The path of Gnosis emphasizes constant learning, the wisdom of past ages, and the value of faith and ritual. Followers of this path rarely progress beyond the fourth layer. All of the paths are demanding, but the more demanding the path, the higher up the mountain you can get, and the more perfect you become. That is, if you stick to the path. 
Achieving perfection is a long process, and most don't make it. When a petitioner, a soul from someone who's just died on the prime material plane, enters Mount Celestia, they immediately become an archon. But there's a hierarchy of archons, as you'd expect there to be in any well-ordered society. And new petitioners start at the bottom and have to work their way up. Though there are some petitioners of Mount Celestia that don't become archons, such as those who are followers of one of the gods that lives in this plane that prefers different forms for their petitioners. For instance, lawful good dwarves and halflings don't become archons and just remain dwarves and halflings. An archon is a type of celestial, which are basically the upper plane's counterpart to fiends. Celestials are good beings native to the upper planes, though not all good natives of the upper planes are celestials. Just like fiends, there's one type of celestial for each major alignment. Archons are lawful good, native to Mount Celestia. Gardinals are neutral good, native to Elysium. And Eladrin are chaotic good, native to Arborea. Though there is one more main type of celestial, Asimon. Asimon are basically the angels of planescape and can be any good alignment, and they can be found in any of the upper planes though they're much more of a rare sight than other celestials, and are typically more powerful. Since Gardinals and Eladrin don't really have anything to do with Mount Celestia, I'll save talking about them for future videos. Generally speaking, it's the desire of all Archons to work up the ranks through self-improvement and unwavering dedication to the values of Mount Celestia. Or perhaps a better way of putting it is that they seek to do as much good as possible and become the best versions of themselves, and the reward of advancement is merely a side effect of that. Their end goal is eventually to merge with the plane itself, or to be transformed into a greater Asimon so that they may be a truly unstoppable force for good. There are seven types or ranks of Archons, though 3rd edition adds three more, and there are seven levels within each type, which is shown through what type of metal the Archon wears. Each rank of Archon is subservient to those of higher rank, though I should note that these ranks might not be straightforward. Looking at the power levels in the order they're listed in, in the Planes of Law Monster Supplement, certainly makes it seem like it's in a straightforward seven ranks, but the hierarchies of Mount Celestia poster included in the book makes it look like there's six ranks, with two types of Archon sharing a rank. But that poster muddles things in other ways too, that I'll talk about later. The lowest rank is the Lantern Archon. They're friendly floating balls of light with a desire to help other people. They're the most common type of Archon, and while you can find them all over Mount Celestia, usually transporting messages, the vast majority of them are found in the first layer. Since they're just floating balls of light, they can wear no metal, and so there is just the one level of Lantern Archon. They aren't that powerful, but they're nowhere near as weak, lowly, and insignificant as the lowest level fiends of Beator, Lemures, Larvae, and Naparibo. Because Lantern Archons are generally newer to Mount Celestia, The other Archons treat them like children. The second rank is the Hound Archon. They have the shape of humanoids with canine heads. They're the guardians of the first two layers. Each of them has 100 Lantern Archons with whom they share a telepathic bond and can call upon for help if needed. Hound Archons wear metal collars, and the type of metal indicates their virtue, or their level of dedication to law and good. From lowest to highest, there's lead, tin, brass, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. When an Archon wearing gold reaches a higher stage of goodness, the gold transforms into platinum, and once they reach the next stage, the Archon transforms into the next rank of Archon, and their metal goes back to lead. So an Archon has to work up through the seven stages until it can advance to the next rank of Archon. It should be noted that the levels between each rank, these different types of metals, are all equal to each other in station and authority. A Hound Archon wearing a bronze collar ranks just the same and commands just as much respect as a Hound Archon wearing a gold collar. The gold collar just means they're further on their way to the next rank, and as Archons are creatures of virtue, they feel no jealousy or bitterness towards those wearing better medals, or those of higher rank. The third rank is the Warden Archon. They look like large, hulking humans with the heads of grizzly bears and clawed hands. They have the strength and superior senses of grizzly bears, but vast intelligence and a compassionate nature. They display their level of virtue through metal collars and bracers. The role of Warden Archons is to guard the portals that lead from layer to layer, ensuring that only the worthy pass. Another role of the Warden Archons is to oversee the 196 provinces of each layer, one Warden per province. Hound Archons and Warden Archons occasionally fall into the ways of chaos, and instead of remaining as Archons, become Asuras, 
which are a type of chaotic good celestial. The fourth rank is the Sword Archon. Sword Archons look like humans with silver hair and glowing eyes, but instead of arms, they have wings. So Sword Archon is something of a misnomer because they don't use swords, nor is combat their primary role. Sure, they're powerful in a fight, but their main role is to carry messages from the Tome Archons throughout all of Mount Celestia's layers, to disseminate knowledge and orders from high-ranking Archons to the lower ranks. I suppose 3rd edition also thought it was weird that they had no swords, so in that edition they have arms and wings, and those arms can transform into fiery blades, which they use to enforce the laws of Mount Celestia. They display their level of virtue through collars, greaves, and breastplates. The fifth rank is the Trumpet Archon. They look like winged elves, but even more beautiful. They each wear a metal collar and breastplate. They also carry silver trumpets with them to announce their arrival. Any non-Archon who hears the piercing beauty of the trumpet blast must make a successful saving throw or be temporarily paralyzed. If needed, their trumpets transform into silver swords. Trumpet Archons also act as messengers of higher Archons, but their true duty is in escorting the spirits of the dead back to their bodies when they're resurrected. Trumpet Archons are the only Archons free to leave Mount Celestia of their own will. Other Archons can leave, but only when ordered to. They're also the only rank that are ruled by one of their own. Israfel, a trumpet archon, assigns the other trumpet archons their duties. The sixth rank is the throne archon. They look like humans with golden skin and fair hair. They carry swords and are bedecked in metal armor that radiates light. The role of the throne archons is to rule the cities and realms of Mount Celestia. While the throne archons rank slightly lower than the tome archons, and they rule smaller areas, it's said that the Throne Archons are the real rulers of Mount Celestia, as they deal with the day-to-day -day governance of resolving disputes and enacting order. Like with Hound and Warden Archons, transformation into an Asura can occasionally happen to Sword Archons and Throne Archons too, in which case it's a demotion. Before I get to the 7th rank, I should mention the Archons added in 3rd edition, which are Owl Archons, Justice Archons, and Word Archons. Owl Archons look like owls and protect the skies of Mount Celestia. They also serve as messengers and spies. Justice Archons look like gold-skinned, winged humans. They inhabit Imperia, the city of tempered souls on the fifth layer, but are often sent to the lower plains to fight evil. Word Archons are bronze-skinned and glowing, with wings made of parchment papers, each paper bearing a different rune. They protect concepts such as charity and virtue and are masters of true speech which is the original language of the universe, in which there is a word for every thing, action, and creature, and learning something's true name provides immense power over it. These additional Archons don't have a set place within the Archon ranks, and to be honest, they kind of ruin the whole pattern of everything being in sevens. Seven layers, seven types of metal per rank, but ten Archons? That's just not right. The Forgotten Realms wiki places Justice Archons in between Hound and Warden Archons, and puts Word Archons in between Warden and Sword Archons. It doesn't have an entry for Owl Archons. But I think, to preserve the seven ranks of Archon, that these three extras should share the same rank as other Archon types, rather than being new ranks of their own. So that way, when you ascend to the third rank, you might either become a Warden Archon or a Justice Archon, depending on your disposition. And when you arrive at the 4th rank, you could become a Sword Archon, a Word Archon, or an Owl Archon. How many times can I say Archon? The 7th rank is the Tome Archon. They look like winged humans with hawk heads. Just like the Throne Archons, they're covered in metal armor. The Tome Archons are the rulers of the 7 layers. There are only 7 known tomes, one for each layer. Each one oversees its layer with near omniscience, their only blind spots being the realms of the gods living in Mount Celestia. They have the power to summon 1,000 lanterns, 500 hounds, 250 wardens, or 125 swords when the need arises. Collectively, these seven tome archons are called the Hebdomad. Since there's only a small handful of these archons, and they each rule a layer, they're a bit like the Mount Celestia equivalent of the Lords of the Nine. However, there are many differences. For one thing, the tome archons have no rivalries with each other. They operate in harmony with one another, not secretly seeking to overthrow each other like the Lords of the Nine. For another thing, they're far less powerful. Tome Archons are certainly more powerful than Pit Fiends, but they're much less powerful than Arch Devils. But in 3rd edition, they're given a bump in power and prestige in order to be more on par with the Lords of the Nine. 
They are upgraded to celestial paragons, the celestial equivalent of archfiends. They no longer have hawk heads, and now they're collectively called the Celestial Hebdomad. The names of the Celestial Hebdomad are the same in 3rd edition as they are in original Planescape. They are Barachiel, the Messenger, Domiel, the Mercy Bringer, Arathael, the Seer, Pistis Sophia, the Ascetic, Raziel, the Crusader, Sealtiel, the Defender, and Zafkiel, the Watcher, with Zafkiel being the leader and the most powerful of the seven. At the dawn age of the universe, before any mortal soul yet existed, Mount Celestia awaited its first petitioners, those souls who would die in service of law and good. The first seven lawful good martyrs to ever exist were shaped by Mount Celestia itself into celestial paragons, and they formed the first celestial hebdomad. In the eons since the beginning, celestial paragons have come and gone. Each time one of them dies, a worthy throne archon transforms to take their place. Zafkiel, a truly ancient figure of immense power, largely shrouded in mystery, is the only original remaining member of the Hebdomad. Many believe that the ascension of Throne Archon to Tome Archon is actually controlled by Zafkiel himself. Barachiel the Messenger is the ruler of Lunia, the first layer. He commands the armies of Mount Celestia against invaders and is the herald of the other celestial paragons. Third edition places him as the leader of the Trumpet Archons rather than Israfel. He has silver skin and wears a robe of violet starlight. He lives in the Citadel of Stars on the shore of the Silver Sea. Domiel the Mercybringer is the ruler of Mercuria, the second layer. Domiel has golden skin and wields a massive flaming greatsword. He has sworn an oath to prevent the desecration of the tombs and mausoleums of this layer. He lives in Orelan, the Golden Spire, a tower of burnished gold rising from a lake formed by the meeting of four rivers. Arathael, the seer, is the ruler of Venya, the third layer. Arathael has pearly skin, blue robes, and a staff, one end wreathed in flame and the other in frost. He foresees the future and oversees a vast library of ancient knowledge. He lives in an undersea library fortress named Xeranthador, where he watches the universe unfold. Pistis Sophia, the ascetic, is the ruler of Solania, the fourth layer. She has indigo skin, silver hair, and translucent wings. She is the embodiment of serenity and sincerity, always speaking the undiluted truth and never displaying a temper. Being a true ascetic, she casts aside all possessions, including clothing and a place of permanent residence, instead preferring to wander the landscape of the fourth layer. Raziel, the crusader, is the ruler of Mertian, the fifth layer. He is also called the Fire Star for his fierce devotion and judicious wrath. He has platinum skin, flames for hair, and carries a sword and shield. Raziel is the patron archon of paladins and devotes his energy to protecting the defenseless. Like Pistis Sophia, he doesn't have a stronghold, but he does take up residence in Imperia, the city of tempered souls, where he can often be found offering spiritual guidance in the city's infirmaries. Sealtiel, the defender, is the ruler of Jovar, the sixth layer. He has ebony skin, no hair, and metallic golden wings. He is a patron of the Warden Archons, and like them, one of his main roles is to prevent the unworthy from entering higher layers. In this case, there is only one higher layer, so it is his duty to ensure that only the purest of souls may reach the seventh heaven. He keeps a fortress known as Pax Exaltia on the sixth terrace of Yetzara, the ziggurat city of seven terraces that leads to Cronius. Zafkiel the Watcher is the ruler of Cronius, the seventh layer. He's described as being stunningly beautiful, with golden skin and platinum white wings. He embodies the perfect good, or at least perfect lawful goodness, and his presence is so powerful that only the most exalted creatures can survive it. Only gods and the other celestial paragons have seen Zafkiel and survived. All others either perish or achieve such a state of supreme goodness that they merge with the plane. The hierarchy of Mount Celestia doesn't stop at Archon, though. There's a whole new type of creature above that, or at least that can be above it. The hierarchy is a bit contradictory and inconsistent, especially among various books and editions of D&D. But of course, the creatures I'm talking about are the Asimon, not to be confused with the Asimar, which are the good equivalent of tieflings. Asimon are angels, basically, though I suppose archons are essentially angels too. In any case, archons are celestials tied specifically to Mount Celestia and lawful good. Asimun are celestials tied to the upper planes more broadly and not bound to any particular spot on the law chaos axis. The types of Asimun are Agathanon, 
Light Asimen, Movanic Divas, Monadic Divas, Astral Divas, Planetars, and Solars. And by the way, I don't really like the pronunciation of Divas because, you know, it sounds like Diva. I typically usually prefer to call them Devas, but apparently Diva is the correct pronunciation. The hierarchies of Mount Celestia poster places all Asimen above Archons. Though, looking at the Planescape Monstrous Compendium, you can see that not all Asimen are more powerful than Archons. It could be that Asimen hold a higher status than Archons, even in the cases when they're less powerful. Or, it could be that because the Planes of Law book was published after the Planescape Monstrous Compendium, that this hierarchy is a revision, and that Asimon are actually more powerful than Archons, despite what the Monstrous Compendium shows. However, there is some weirdness with Tome Archons, because there are only seven of them, and they each hold a position of extreme importance in ruling an entire layer of Mount Celestia. Does it really make sense that they'd be promoted to a Gathanon, who are warriors of the Celestial Armies? Or even Light Asimon, who are essentially holy familiars? Those both seem like a steep demotion. And how often would that happen? How many different leaders are the layers of Mount Celestia churning through, being promoted up to fill the ranks of the Heavenly Armies? And when you take into account how 3rd edition bumps up Tome Archons to be Celestial Paragons, it makes even less sense. That would be like a Lord of the Nine being promoted into a Cornigon, or even an Erinyes. But anyway, there are seven types of Asimon that fit into two categories, Warriors and Celestial Stewards. The warriors are the fighting forces of the Upper Plains, and the Celestial Stewards directly serve the gods of the Upper Plains. Agathanon are the elite vanguard of the Celestial Armies, and they're the only type in the warrior category. On the Upper Plains, they look like elves with luminous skin and shining eyes, but elsewhere they take on other forms. Light Asimon are creatures made up of swirling mists of light energy. It's said that a good creature who looks upon a light Asimon sees in its swirling mists a memory of their finest moment in life, and evil creatures see the life they could have had if they would have made better choices. Light Asimon can only be destroyed on their home plane, otherwise when killed they dissipate and reform on their home plane a month later. Then there are the three types of devas, or I guess I should say divas, astral, monadic, and movanic. They look like stunningly handsome male humans with feathery wings. What's kind of interesting about the divas is that they seem to get less powerful as their privileges increase, though all divas are equal in status, at least according to the Planescape Monstrous Compendium. I'm not sure why divas are put into the Celestial Steward category rather than the Warrior category, as they fight alongside the Agathanon. Perhaps they should be in both categories, as they directly serve the gods too. The special role of astral divas is to be sent to the lower planes to bring justice to evil. They also go to the astral plane to rescue good-aligned mortals, thus their name. Monadic divas have the power to pass into any of the elemental planes at will, and be unaffected by the features of those planes. Movanic divas are able to pass into the prime material plane at will, and are sent to aid mortal followers of good deities in their moments of dire need. Planetars are extremely powerful winged angels with emerald skin and hairless heads. They only aid the most powerful servants of good which in game terms means players of 12th level or higher. They're roughly at the same power level as Pit Fiends. When encountered outside of the Upper Plains, Planetars can't truly be killed. You can destroy their mortal form, but their spirit returns to their home plane to reform a body over the course of four decades. The most powerful and highest ranking Asimen are Solars, mighty enough to be gods themselves, but they choose to be servants of the gods instead. They surpass nearly every other creature in the original Planescape books, though in 5th edition they got nerfed and are only CR 21. Just like Light Asimen, Solars can only be truly destroyed on their home plane, otherwise they regenerate their material form over 7 decades. They have metallic skin and beautiful muscular bodies, a common theme for Archons and Asimen. There is a group of some prominence that's based in Mount Celestia. They're a sect by the name of the Order of the Plains Militant. I already covered them in my video on the sects of Planescape, but I'll describe them briefly here. In Planescape, groups with large followings that are based around a guiding philosophy are known either as factions or as sects. They're factions if they have a presence in Sigil, and they're a sect if they don't. The sects would all like to have presences in Sigil, but the Lady of Pain only suffers so many factions in her city, lest there be another faction war that drives the city to the brink of chaos. So the Order of the Plains Militant is prominent, but not prominent enough to become a proper faction, though they are loosely allied with the Harmonium and the Fraternity of Order. 
The members of the Order of the Plains Militant are also called the Brethren, the Faithful, and the Children of Heaven. The Brethren swear oaths of poverty, chastity, and obedience. They're devoted to law and good, and their primary aim is to defend Mount Celestia and to spread goodness and law through the Outer Plains. Many high-up positions in Mount Celestia's cities are filled by the faithful. As well as Mount Celestia, they have footholds in Bitopia and Arcadia, and have managed to expand Mount Celestia by bringing in chunks of land from Arcadia and the Outlands through the process known as cosmic realignment, which is when a part of one outer plane breaks off from its home plane and gets absorbed by a neighbor plane because its inhabitants have been acting out of step with the home plane's alignment. So when the people living in Arcadia, the plane characterized by being more lawful than good, start acting equally lawful and good, well, if they persist, then wherever they're living leaves Arcadia and enters Mount Celestia. If it were up to the Brethren, they'd make that happen everywhere. They also venture to the lower plains and the plains of conflict to combat evil and chaos, with some of their primary raiding spots being Acheron and Mechanus. Though while they fight evil, spread good, and seek to expand Mount Celestia's territory, they don't do forced conversions. Like all other Outer Plains, the workings of magic are altered on Mount Celestia. Spells that encourage chaos, disruption, and evil are diminished, harder to cast, or just don't work here. Additionally, the further you are away from being lawful good, the more likely your spells are to fail. But there are some upsides to magic here. If your alignment is non-evil lawful, or good, then you receive the effects of a permanent bless spell as long as you're in this plane. And if you're lawful good, then you also receive the effects of a permanent protection from evil spell. Each of the layers also has magical restorative properties. The first layer has just those bless and protection from evil effects. The second layer also slows poison. The third layer neutralizes poison. The fourth layer removes curses from its visitors. The fifth layer cures diseases. And the sixth layer acts as a restoration spell once a year. I would imagine that means immediately upon entering the layer, and then you can't gain the benefit again until a year has passed. If you make it to the seventh layer, well, who knows what glorious things await you there. Most people think ascending to the seventh layer means merging with the plane itself, or being transformed into a greater Asimon, such as a planetar or solar. Perhaps both are true, and which one happens to you just depends on your disposition and desires. Also, like other outer planes, Magic users visiting Mount Celestia will need spell keys. Spell keys are things, sometimes physical, sometimes not, that are needed for spells to work properly in other planes. Each plane has its own keys. Since spell keys can be a bit wonky and fiddly, and most people I know pretty much ignore spell components anyway, I consider spell keys to be optional. I mean, I guess technically everything is optional in D&D. You're free to include or exclude whatever you like as a DM, but spell keys are very optional but I do like to mention them because they can add to the flavor of the Outer Plains. In Mount Celestia, all spell keys are metal of different shapes and compositions. Higher level spells require purer metals, such as untarnished silver or pure gold. The school of magic will determine what shape your key needs to be. Cups for enchantment, blades for evocation, hearts for necromancy, stars for conjuration, circles for abjuration, bowls for divination, wands for alteration, and dust for illusion. So now that you know all about Mount Celestia's alignment, its main inhabitants, how to ascend the ranks, and how to use magic there, how do you actually get there? Well, compared to a plane like Beator, it's not that hard to get to. Mount Celestia has gates to many planes, such as the Prime Material Plane, Bitopia, Arcadia, Mechanus, Elysium, the Outlands, and of course, to Sigil. On Mount Celestia, the gates are sets of carved pillars. Naturally, these gates are guarded because the Archons don't want surprise invasions from the lower plains, but they're only really guarded against those seeking to do evil. Mount Celestia is actually a pretty welcoming place. Even evil creatures can come here so long as they're not intent on doing evil, because after all, they may be looking for the path to righteousness. So if you're looking to visit Mount Celestia, there are a few options. Find a portal in one of the other upper plains. Follow the river Oceanus from Elysium to the Silver Sea. Oceanus, by the way, pretty much acts as the equivalent to the river Styx, just for the upper planes. You can find a portal in Sigil, use a plane shift spell, a gate spell, or a cubic gate, though those are quite rare. You can find an astral conduit in the prime material plane, or find a color pool in the astral plane. 
dying is always an option too, and it's likely the most popular way to get to the seven heavens. So long as you are lawful good in life, and nothing has happened that would prevent your spirit from traveling to the outer planes after death. Though you might want to avoid dying again, because in most cases, when a petitioner dies, they die for good. If they die on their home plane, death usually means absorption into the plane. And if they die elsewhere, it usually means oblivion. Those two things might sound the same, but according to petitioners, there is a real difference. Seeing how the petitioners of Mount Celestia want nothing more than to merge with the plane, there must be a reason that they don't all kill themselves, or throw themselves into every battle hoping to die. For one thing, I would guess committing suicide is not looked upon favorably by the Seven Heavens. And for another thing, while Archons do ultimately wish to merge with the plane, they want to do as much good as they can before then. Perhaps the further on your path you get before merging with the plane, the more rewarding it is, or the more good it does for the plane. Perhaps merging with the plane really means merging with a particular layer, and you'd rather merge with the highest layer that you can. But anyway, in D&D, if the life you lived was good, but more lawful than good, you'd go to Arcadia when you die. If the life you lived was more good than lawful, you'd go to Bitopia. But if you live your life equally devoted to the ideals of goodness and law, then when you die, you'll be reborn as a lantern archon in the seven heavens, with only dim memories of your past life at best. But you won't mind the fact that you can't remember your past life, because you'll be so happy to be here. But if you don't want to have to wait until death to arrive here, there is one other way, provided you've already found a way to the Outlands, and that's by entering the gate in Excelsior, Mount Celestia's gate town. The Outlands, also called the Plane of Concordant Opposition, is the plane of true neutrality. It kind of acts as the center of the Outer Planes. It's the center of the Great Ring, it's where Sigil is, resting at the top of a spire of infinite height in the center of the plane, and it's one of the primary ways to get to all of the other Outer Planes, with each Outer Plane having a corresponding gate town. These gate towns are settlements home to a portal that leads to their plane, and they reflect their Outer Plane in style and culture. Excelsior is Mount Celestia's gate town. Excelsior! <laughs> Excelsior is a town of gleaming towers. The streets are made of yellow brick with flecks of enchanted silver and steel, making the whole place glow. It's a comforting glow, strong enough that it provides enough light to read by in the evenings, but not so strong that it prevents you from getting a good night's sleep. These enchanted bricks also provide warmth, and that too is a pleasant level of warmth. It's like what you'd set your home thermostat to if you didn't have to worry about paying energy bills. But that warmth pervades the whole town, so there's no need to light fires to stay warm. The skies around Excelsior are circled with floating castles called picket keeps that revolve around the town. There's about a dozen of them, and they're home to paladin lords who protect the town. Every few decades, one of the keeps lands at the edge of town and stays there. Most of the inhabitants of Excelsior are human, though some archons and divas live here. A lot of the humans that live here are paladins, and of course the Order of the Plains Militant has a strong presence in town. Naturally, the vast majority of inhabitants are lawful good, and they treat visitors with welcome arms, even if they have different alignments, for the most part. Those of non-good alignments are kindly asked to leave, though they won't be forced out unless they start breaking laws. Most people that live in Excelsior would love nothing more than for the town to cross over into Mount Celestia though many inhabitants of the town are actually hesitant to enter Mount Celestia, as they know that once they experience its splendor, everywhere else will seem worse in comparison. Surprisingly, Excelsior is home to a thieves' guild known as the Holy Shadow, though they only prey upon those of non-good or non-lawful alignment. This group may be what's responsible for keeping Excelsior from achieving cosmic realignment. In 5th edition, this group is replaced by the Order of the Iron Lantern, who take their protective behavior to the extreme, trying to catch evildoers before they act, arresting innocents for the slightest suspicion. In original Planescape, Excelsior is ruled over by an elderly human paladin named High Chancellor Maguala Abd al-Ragharin. In 5th edition, the ruler is a human archmage named High Chancellor Foro. In 5th edition Planescape, there's more than just picket keeps floating in the sky. The sky is home to a whole district of Excelsior known as the Chandelier. Clouds as solid as earth drift through the sky, supporting businesses and mansions, as well as picket keeps. There's a taxi service of winged chariots for those who can't fly up to the chandelier on their own. In original Planescape, the town of Heart's Faith on the first layer of Mount Celestia was the previous gate town. In 5th edition, it's kind of the other way around. 
Hearts Faith used to be a town in Mount Celestia and now comprises the surface district of Excelsior. Other noteworthy sites in Excelsior include the Forum, a public amphitheater where people gather to debate the nature of good and law, Nimbron, the floating castle of the most powerful paladin lord in town, known as Thotatus of Tyr, the Zephyr Stables, a floating Pegasus ranch, the owner lends her flying horses out to worthy riders, and the Godstrand, the tallest tower in Excelsior, where the gate is located. The Godstrand is actually the second tallest thing in all of the Outlands, only the spire is taller. The peak of the tower is always obscured by soft, luminous clouds. The tower is full of nothing but staircases that twist and branch endlessly. One of these staircases leads to the gate. In 5th edition, there is a noticeable gate, and it's flanked by a pair of Warden Archons, just as the gates inside Mount Celestia are. In original Planescape, you pass through the gate without even noticing as you're climbing the stairs, suddenly deposited 20 feet over the waters of Mount Celestia's first layer. Lunia is the first of the seven heavens. It's known as the Silver Heaven, and it resembles the astral plane in some ways. The sky is a perpetual night filled with silvery stars and a full moon illuminating everything. Coming in from most places, when you enter Mount Celestia, this is the layer you'll be arriving in. And the point of entry is always the Silver Sea, also sometimes called the Silvery Sea. It's an infinitely large ocean of holy water, so most undead or fiends that come here won't be alive for long. The Silver Sea is full of life, such as dolphins, balena, sea elves, and zoveri. Zoveri are basically centaurs of the sea, with upper halves of a man and lower halves of an octopus. They're kind creatures who offer aid to anyone struggling in the ocean. The Silver Sea is dotted with islands, many of which contain towns and citadels. Far out in Lunia's waters stands a tower encased in blue flame. The Tower of Fire, as it's called, seems to act as a lighthouse for the ships traveling the Silver Sea, but people are convinced there's more to the tower than just that. The only way to reach the tower is by swimming, as flying and teleporting to it just don't work. This has led some to believe that the Tower of Fire is a type of test. Those who reach the tower discover that its flames don't burn. You can pass your hand right through the fire with no ill effects. The rooms inside the tower shift and change every seven days, with some rooms disappearing completely and others appearing out of nowhere, sometimes filled with treasure, though it's said that those who come to the tower with minds full of greed leave empty-handed. But others, more pure hearts, can find items of surpassing power within. It's also said that if you spend too much time in the tower, the blue flames become a part of you. Maybe it turns your hair blue, or kindles your eyes with a blue fire, or maybe your fingertips turn into blue flame like Hades in Hercules. Of course, the most noticeable feature in the Silver Sea is the gigantic mountain of Mount Celestia proper. The gate to Excelsior drops you just offshore from the town of Hearts Faith, the previous gate town. Hearts Faith is built into a steep cliffside by the shore of the Silver Sea. It's a town of trust and grace. It's a town of cobblestones and sparkling fountains, where the children are well-behaved, elders are respected, and no one locks their doors. The town has a large population of Lamasu, intelligent, magical lion creatures, who were probably the residents of the gate town before it crossed over, and continue to live there now. The leader of the town is a greater Lamasu named Liebs, or Lebes, I'm not sure how to say it, who rules from the temple of Mitra in the center of town. Mitra is the Vedic god of friendship, contracts, warmth, light, and growth. He resides in the second layer. Hart's faith has a militia of sometimes overzealous Lamasu named the Winged Lions, and this seems like it morphed into the Order of the Iron Lantern in 5th edition, because they're known to arrest and interrogate innocent people merely because they're suspicious of them. Lunia is home to several gods, and so are several of the other layers. In Planescape, the homes of the gods are called realms. They're kind of like sub-layers within a layer. They often look drastically different from the layer they exist in and operate on different rules. Unlike layers, though, a portal usually isn't required to enter them. It's more like a boundary that you can simply step over. The gods that reside in Lunia are Briaspati, Trishina, Tyr, the Shichifukujin, and Bahamut, though Bahamut's a bit of a special case. The realm of Briaspati is known as Nectar of Life. Briaspati is the Vedic god of wisdom and worship. He reminds the other gods of their divine duties, and he reminds mortals that their belief is needed to keep the gods alive. But he doesn't just ask for prayer without returning anything. He also provides wisdom and helps mortals achieve states of higher consciousness. Nectar of Life is a serene and contemplative land of mountains, valleys, and orchards. 
The largest town in Nectar of Life is called Omiriel, where you will find the highest quality books there is. Its largest library is Katsudharma, and the bookkeepers are known to travel far and wide throughout the plains searching for rare knowledge. Every bit of knowledge that's ever been known to the worshippers of Brihaspati is stored in this realm. A warden archon known as the Lamplighter watches over this realm. He also rules over the Hound Archons of Mount Celestia. Nectar of Life is home to several portals to Sigil. There's one in Omiriel that leads to the Halls of Records in Sigil, which is the headquarters of the Faded Faction. There's one in the largest monastery in the realm that leads to the archives of the Fraternity of Order. And there's a portal in one of the Order of the Plains Militants' several outposts here, the tower known as the Pinnacle of Indigo. Trishina is a goddess of the Asathalfinare pantheon, or however you say that, I have no idea. A collection of good aligned sea gods, with Deep Sashalas, a god of sea elves, as the leader. Trishina, his consort, is the goddess of dolphins and also of sea elves. Her realm wanders with her from the waters of Mount Celestia to Elysium, though it can often be found offshore nearby Heart's Faith. It's a beautiful coral reef of warm ocean currents where sea creatures come to trade. The Eight Happinesses is the realm of the Shichifukujin a collection of Japanese gods known as the Seven Lucky Gods, or the Seven Gods of Happiness. There isn't really any information at all about this realm, or these gods in the Planescape books, as far as I can tell, aside from the name. But you might be wondering, if they're the Seven Gods of Happiness, then why is the realm called the Eight Happinesses? Well, according to Wikipedia, there are actually eight Shishifukujin, but some of them are variously omitted to make seven. Tyr is the Norse god of courage, oaths, law, in swordsmanship. He's also a god in the Faerunian pantheon. He's one of the few gods that has more than one realm. He keeps a realm with many of the other Norse gods in Asgard, on the layer of Isgard in the plain of Isgard. But he also keeps one here in Lunia, called the Court. It's a great marble hall, very much like a court of law, and no lie can be spoken here. In a book released later into third edition, Player's Guide to Faerun, which uses the World Tree cosmology instead of Planescape's Great Wheel cosmology, Tyr's court exists in a plain known as the House of the Triad, which consists of three mountains all encircling Mount Celestia. Helm, Torm, Ilmater, and a demigoddess named Siamorph also reside in the House of the Triad. Helm is the god of guardians and protection, and his realm is Everwatch. It's a watchtower occupied by a mysterious guardian clad in mithril. It acts as the defense of the House of the Triad. In Planescape, Everwatch is in Mechanus. Ilmater is the god of endurance and suffering. His realm is known as martyrdom. No creature here can feel any pain, fatigue, or exhaustion. But in Planescape, Ilmater's realm is located in Bytopia. Siamorph is a demigoddess of nobility, and her realm is called the Alabaster Palace. She existed kind of in Planescape, at least in 2nd edition, but didn't have a realm because she was such a small-time goddess, being worshipped primarily by the noble class of Waterdeep. And Torm, on the other hand, I'll talk about later, because in Planescape, he also has a realm on Mount Celestia. It's just not in this layer. Bahamut is the last god that resides in Lunia. But Bahamut doesn't just live in Lunia. Bahamut's palace simultaneously exists on all of the first four layers of Mount Celestia, appearing in various places from time to time. It even appears inside other realms. Sometimes it appears in Nectar of Life, and sometimes it appears in the halfling realm of Green Fields. It contains portals to the astral plane and the elemental plane of air. Bahamut is the god of good dragons and wisdom, so he's essentially the opposite of Tiamat. Tiamat is the goddess of evil dragons, meaning chromatic dragons, dragons that are black, white, green, blue, or red. And Bahamut is the god of good dragons, metallic dragons, dragons that are gold, silver, bronze, copper, or brass. Bahamut's palace is built from the hoard of treasure that he's accumulated over the eons, and since it exists in multiple layers at once, it's essentially the only known shortcut in Mount Celestia, though in order to pass, you'll have to appease Bahamut. The second layer is Mercuria, the Golden Heaven. As you'd expect from its name, this layer is bathed in golden light. This is a layer of thin air, high hopes, and higher mountains. The thin air takes a bit of getting used to, and it makes a person giddy. To match the steep mountains, this layer also has deep valleys carved out by fast-running streams and rivers. There are a few flat valleys and meadows in the lower plains, and plateaus in the highest places of the layer, and it's here where most of the people in this layer live. Mercuria is the armory and mustering ground of Mount Celestia, where archons drill and hone their battle skills. In that way, it's similar to Mertian. It's also home to the tombs of the noblest fighters who have died in the service of the Seven Heavens. 
Mercuria is a popular place for gods to keep their realms. There's Surya, Mitra, Halen, Giru, Lakshmi, Vishnu, Amaterasu, Rao, Torm, and of course, Bahamut. Surya and Mitra share a realm called Goldfire. Mitra, as I already described a bit earlier, is the Vedic god of friendship, contracts, warmth, light, and growth. Surya is the Vedic god of morning and evening. Both are sun gods, though Surya is thought of as the complete embodiment of the sun. Surya is also a god of healing, luck, light, and enlightenment. Their realm of goldfire holds a prominent place in Mercuria. The realm is bathed in constant radiance. The sun waxes and wanes, but never sets. This sunlight destroys undead and renders invisibility impossible. If you step into a shadow or some source of magical darkness while in Goldfire, you cease to exist, and you won't come back into existence again until light shines down on you, or the spot that you were in. Goldfire is known for its expert weavers, tailors, and dyers. It's also known for its wands of light that radiate sunlight and warmth, the perfect thing to buy if you're planning on going somewhere particularly dark. Goldfire has two main cities. Pashrita and Marishad. Pashrita is Mitra's city of warmth, and Marishad is Surya's city of the dawn. Pashrita is a city of bright white buildings and contains a gate to Bitopia, to Savitri's realm, another sun god in the Vedic pantheon. However, the location of Savitri's realm was changed to Elysium in this book, so perhaps you should think of it as a portal to Elysium instead. Marishad is a jasmine-scented city of many colored walls. The citizens of Bashrita are boisterous, while the citizens of Marashad are more timid and meek, though very friendly. Halen, the god of noble war and leadership from the discontinued birthright campaign setting, has a realm called Honor's Glory. It's a realm of shining steel and bright ideals. It's filled with farmland, beautiful forests, and rolling green hills dotted by cities and white marble castles. Anyone who enters this realm with intentions of treachery or dishonor emits a foul black aura and is taken to stand before a tribunal in the gleaming city of Il Nuir, the greatest city in honor's glory. The Undying Flame is the realm of the Babylonian god Giru. He's the god of fire and righteousness. The whole realm is made entirely of fire, but the fire only hurts those who are impure or evil. Vishnu, the Vedic god of preservation, mercy, and light, maintains a realm in Mercuria known as the Divine Lotus. It's a place where nothing crumbles before its time, where the petitioners are all young and strong. Lakshmi, Vedic god of fortune, can also be found here. The Divine Lotus represents Svarga, or heaven in the early Vedic tradition, the afterlife you go to if you've accumulated good karma, but eventually you experience Punarmaritya, or redeath, and rebirth back into the physical world. Heaven is nice and all, but it's not what the followers of the Vedic gods are after, which is nirvana in Buddhist terms, or moksha in Hindu terms. They want release from samsara, the karmic wheel. So, in planescape terms, what they're really after is true death, just like what the dustmen, one of the factions of Sigil, want. True death is what likely happens when you merge with the plane or ascend to the seventh heaven, though the dustmen don't believe that. Amaterasu is the Japanese goddess of the sun. Her realm is called Radiant Light, though the light here is actually better described as soft and soothing, and sometimes a bit sleepy. Nothing here casts a shadow, and secret plans always fail. Rao is a god from the Greyhawk campaign setting. He's the god of reason, intellect, and peace, and he keeps a realm here called Sweet Reason, though that's about all there is to say about it. Torm also has a realm in Mercuria called True Heart. Torm is a Faerunian deity of loyalty, righteousness, and law and a patron deity to paladins. In the World Tree Cosmology of 3rd edition, True Heart was in the House of the Triad, along with Helm, Tyr, and Ilmater. While I mentioned Bahamut in the section on Lunia, if Bahamut's true home can be said to be anywhere, it's on this layer. With the uncanny way his palace operates, seemingly being in multiple places at once and appearing and disappearing at will, it isn't always visible in other layers. But here, it nearly always is. Venya is the third layer. It's called the Pearly Heaven for its soft white glow. The mountains here are old and rounded, usually green, but sometimes covered in snow. There are gentle brooks that run warm and clear, and many are dammed to form small lakes. Many of this layer's slopes are terraced fields or woodlands. There's a mountain lake of half-frozen water known as the Glass Tarn. It's said to contain a conduit at the very bottom of its depths leading to a multitude of places, such as the astral plane, the elemental plane of water, 
the well of Mimir and Isgard, and the waters of the Norns and the Outlands. Over the eons, the Tarn has become something of a wishing well, and with all the offerings that have been thrown in over all that time, well, there's quite a lot of treasure down there. They say that those who provide an offering and are deemed worthy are rewarded with a powerful vision, and the unworthy are chased off by a sword archon that comes out of the water. Compared to the first two layers, few gods make their home here. The most prominent realm is known as Green Fields, and it's the primary afterlife of the halflings. So if you're a lawful good halfling who's stayed true to your gods, then instead of becoming an archon when you die, you'll come here, keeping the body of a halfling. The halfling gods Yondala, Arvarine, and Sirilali reside here. Yondala is the primary halfling deity. She is their protector and goddess of fertility. Arvarine is also a protector god, but more in the sense of war and vigilance. Since he is a halfling god, and halflings aren't very warlike, he doesn't actively promote war, but he does drill an elite group of halfling warriors in green fields known as the Keepers. Sirolali is the halfling goddess of friendship, trust, home, and hospitality. Greenfields is a place of small comforts, burrowed houses, and unfailing crops. It's basically the Shire, except better. The weather is mild, the harvests are plentiful, and there are no large predators. The countryside isn't completely wild, but it's also not completely domesticated. Troubles are forgotten, and you might get so comfortable, you never want to leave. And I mean that in the best way, not in some secretly sinister way. Greenfields is home to many towns, such as Candlewood, Marston on Water, Thistledowns, Amberwell, Turtle Creek, and Bunbury Hills. Each town is built around a central, ancient tree, and each town's tree is a different species, kind of like a mascot for the town. Fields of Glory is another realm here in Venia. It's the home of Hieronius, god of justice, honor, and war, in the Greyhawk setting. He is the patron deity for paladins in that setting, and there isn't really any information about the realm aside from its name. The fourth layer of Mount Celestia is Solania, the Electrum Heaven. Here the sky shines with the glow of burnished silver. This layer has the comforting, earthy feeling of a warm fireside. Solania, unsurprisingly by now, is a mountainous layer. The peaks of the mountains are topped with snowy monasteries, and the valleys are shrouded in luminescent fogs and mists. The roads of Solania know only two conditions, impassable and filled with knee-deep mud. Many passes are only open for a few weeks each year. For as comforting as Solania can be, it's also a layer of toil that takes persistence and dedication to travel through. Avalanches and rock slides occur here regularly, but for every danger, there's equal parts reward. The mountains and stream beds are rich with ore, so it's fitting that this layer contains the primary afterlife of the dwarves. Due to the harsh terrain, settlements in this layer are few and far between. The settlements are often filled with petitioners, waiting for spring to begin and the canyons of ice to melt so that they can rush up the slopes, searching for the right path to the next layer. This layer acts as something of a barrier, as many petitioners never find the gate to the fifth heaven. The problem is that everyone thinks the portal to the next layer is in some particular spot that they just can't find. But in reality, the portal can be reached from any of this layer's mountaintops. It's a place that lies within each petitioner. Only after answering one of Jazirian's riddles can you progress to the fifth layer. The Order of the Plains Militant has a presence all over Mount Celestia, but it's this layer where that presence is strongest. The first monastery of the Plains Militant is one of their foremost bastions. Like the other monasteries in this layer, it's built on a rocky plateau just above the clouds. It's invisible from below, hidden in the mists, and from above it looks as though it rests on a bed of clouds. The path to the monastery is well defended, and to reach the actual monastery you must first cross a bridge spanning a chasm of unknown depth, as the bottom is obscured by fog. Suffice to say, it's a long drop. The monastery has five stories and is half a mile long, and contains hundreds of rooms. The first monastery is said to be the source of all paladins' power, and the repository of their battle lore. Though perhaps take that with a grain of salt, because as you've probably noticed, there are a lot of things claiming responsibility for the power of paladins. When Mount Celestia needs heroes, it calls upon the Order of the Plains Militant. Solania holds the realm of the dwarven gods Moradin and Baronar True Silver. This realm, named Arachanor, is the afterlife of the dwarves, at least the dwarves that follow Moradin and or Baronar, above the other dwarven gods, which most dwarves probably do 
because Moradin Allfather is the creator of the dwarves and the greatest god of the dwarven pantheon. He's a god of creation and smithing. Baronar True Silver is his wife and the goddess of safety, truth, home, and healing. While she's still fierce as any dwarven deity ought to be, she's also gentle, and it's mostly due to her influence that Arachnor is a place of beauty as well as strength. Arachnor is mostly an underground realm with towns, mines, forges, and roads, all within a great mountain. The largest settlements are Istor's Forge, Stonewall, The Rift, and Baranar's Side, each one a jam-packed, stony collection of tunnels, small living quarters, armories, and fine carvings, all kept in good order. Istor's Forge is a town built in a circle around a core of pure white lava used for smelting. Stonefall is not completely underground. It's set in a narrow valley that mostly blocks out the light of the lair. The Rift is a long underground city built into a narrow crevasse that serves as the city's main road. It's the most accessible city to the visitors of the Fourth Heaven. Baranar's Side is a fortified city that's half on the surface of the mountain and half within it. It's home to portals to two of the other dwarven realms, Mount Clangadin in Arcadia and the Dwarven Mountain in the Outlands. Moradin can usually be found at the Soul Forge, though the Soul Forge isn't the type of place you can just walk into whenever you want. It's the birthplace of the dwarves, where Moradin breathes life into each dwarf and sends their spirits to the prime material plane. If you're careless and get into Moradin's way, he may pick you up and send you off into the prime to be born into a dwarf's body. The Soul Forge is also rumored to be where the dwarf petitioners return to oneness with the plane. Some say the forge is the source of Solania's warmth, and that the smoke from the foundry forms the mists that pervade the lair. There are at least five other gods that reside here, but make that four if you don't count Bahamut. Jazirian, Paladine, Chung Kuel, and Quan Yin. Chung Kuel is the Chinese god of truth and testing, and has a realm known as the Ministry of Virtue. Quan Yin is the Chinese goddess of childbirth and mercy. Her realm is called the Lotus Garden, and it houses the largest of Solania's mountaintop monasteries. Paladine is the primary god of good in the Dragonlance setting. He is the god of order, hope, light, rulership, and guardianship. He's essentially the opposite of Tachesis. Like Tachesis, he often takes the form of a great dragon. And just like how Tachesis is sometimes regarded as being the same entity as Tiamat, Paladine is sometimes regarded as being another name for Bahamut. In the 5th edition book, Fizban's Treasury of Dragons, Tachesis is Tiamat and Paladine is Bahamut. But in 2nd edition, they are different, thus why they have separate realms. His realm is called the Dome of Creation. Jazirian is the god of the Kuatil, keeper of wisdom and rebirth. Jazirian is both a male and a female at the same time. In 2nd edition, Jazirian is the counterpart god to Asmodeus. In my Guide to Beator video, I described how the two serpents of law arose from the chaos in the dawning of the universe, and together established the fundamental principles of planescape, the unity of rings, the rule of threes, and the center of all, before breaking apart over their differences, with Asmodeus, then called Araman, falling to the deepest pit of Beator, and Jazirian flying to the seven heavens. Jazirian's blood droplets formed the first Kuatil. In 3rd edition, Jazirian is a fragmentation of the more primordial god known as the World Serpent. Jazirian's realm is called Ouroboros, the Gates of Wisdom. It's a test of virtue. It exists within the clouds above the peaks of Solania, but it's only accessible by falling. You must take a leap of faith from one of the mountain tops of the fourth layer and fall into the misty void. Creatures that can fly have to beat their wings until they're too exhausted to fly, so they too must fall. The realm is an entirely airy place, with some describing it less as a physical place and more as a place within, a place of lightness, exhaustion, relief, and bliss. The fifth layer is Mertian, the Platinum Heaven. Its sky is similar in color to Solania's, but the silver burns even brighter. Mertian is a layer of great sweeping plains and citadels. The mountains here, if they can truly be called mountains, are huge, spherical, black domes made of a slick and featureless black stone. Though the stones aren't bare, many of them are covered by forests and snow. The tops of these domes hold portals to the next layer. Stairs are carved into some of them, the tops of the rest can only be reached by flying. The domes are rumored to be the steps that the gods used when they first ascended Mount Celestia. The citadels of Mertian are also black, 
likely made from the same stone that the domes are. These citadels are the marshalling grounds for paladins, sword archons, light asimen, divas, and other lawful good creatures. There aren't any realms on Mertian, at least as far as I can tell, though 4th edition D&D moves Bahamut's palace to the top of one of Mertian's domes. It's fitting. Bahamut's palace seems to exist everywhere, so why not here too? Though while there aren't any realms here, there still are a few notable places. The dusty plains of Arvena, the chanting grounds, are the crucible of warriors, where archons and planar visitors alike perfect their battle skills. Planars are people who were born in the Outer Plains, not people who died and are living their afterlife there. It's also full of choirs and chantries, which is why it's called the Chanting Grounds. Arvana is home to the Celestial Bells, whose tone can be heard throughout the whole lair. The bells keep time for Arvana, which is rather important for the people who train here because they keep very tight, regimented schedules, leaving essentially no time for rest. Luckily, in Arvena, you can fight as much as you want and not fear permanent injury, as all wounds heal rapidly while in the chanting grounds. Arvena's Hall of Heralds keeps records of the heraldic devices of all archons and members of the Order of the Plains Militant. Imperia, the city of tempered souls, is another important place in the fifth layer. Similarly to Arvena, Imperia is a place where hard work and virtue is its own reward. The city of tempered souls lies at the base of the fifth layer. It rests on the edge of a mountain lake. It's known for its healers and hospitals, because many pilgrims become injured while traversing the fourth layer. Imperia also contains many healing fountains and baths. These can restore lost limbs, restore sanity, and continued use of the curative waters can even purify the mind of evil and chaos. The city walls are manned by lantern archons, and the streets are patrolled by warden archons. The city militia is split into eight watches, the red, the white, the black, the yellow, the green, the purple, the indigo, and the azure. They all have an intense rivalry and hold yearly tournaments. Imperia isn't the only city in the fifth layer. There's two more prominent ones. Remfa, the city of the sands of time, and Soked Hezi, the city of swords. Remfa is a city where time flows backward, forward, and sideways. The strange flow of time is mostly in relation to the world around you, such as the seasons. It doesn't exactly mean that your own actions will be undone and redone. Summer might change to spring, to winter, and to spring again. Part of the reason this happens is that Remfa is home to a portal to the demiplane of time. Technically, it's a portal to the astral plane, then to the primaterial plane, then to the ethereal, and then to the demiplane of time. The portal was constructed by the city's ruler, a renegade Modron Secundus, whom they call the Clockmaker. His reasons for building it aren't known. Modrons are the semi-mechanical natives of Mechanus. Their society is made up of a strict caste system of 15 levels. Secundus is the second highest level. There are only four Secundi, so they're quite powerful. If you want a comparison, they're more powerful than Throne Archons, but less powerful than Tome Archons. But since the Secundus who rules Renfa is a renegade, and the role of Secundi is to rule one of the four quarters of Mechanus, I believe that means there are actually five Secundi, maybe more in that any Modron who goes rogue gets replaced, or, preferably for the Modron, killed. Remfa is known for its timekeeping devices such as sundials and clocks. Death clocks are also for sale, though they're a bit rare. These devices count the hours remaining until a particular person dies. Usually, that's the person who buys the clock, but sometimes you want to know when someone else is going to die, and they're good for that too. The final place worth talking about in Mertian is Soked Hezi, the City of Swords. This is a city that prides itself on preparedness, valor, and supreme martial organization. It's encircled by four protective walls, each with terraced farms between them. The City of Swords boasts an impressive army, 1,000 Sword Archons and 7,777 Warden Archons, accompanied by a choir of 300 Hound Archons to warn their enemies of their impending beatdown. The choir, known as the True and Righteous, sometimes go to Arcadia and Bytopia, seeking converts to the ways of law and good. They're rarely successful, but their skill is appreciated all the same. The sixth layer is Jovar, the Glittering Heaven, also called the Heaven of Gems. This layer is filled with a pulsing, many-colored lights from the gems that lie in the floor and sky, or perhaps I should say ceiling, as Jovar is a celestial vault. Few make it here, yet because even fewer make it to the seventh layer, the few who find their way here start to pile up over time, so there are actually many Archons to be found in the lair, most of them residing in Yetzira, the heavenly city. 
The sparkling light of Yetzira is visible from a hundred miles away. The city is something of a paradox to most people. It's both serene and boisterous, both wise and innocent, where enlightenment and action coexist in harmony. The city is ruled over by a council of throne archons, and has the shape of a seven-layered ziggurat, each terrace large enough to be a city in its own right. The seventh terrace is the lowest. The fourth terrace contains the radiant arsenal, where magical weapons are stored. Many of these weapons contain the essences of archons who failed to reach Cronius, and instead chose to serve as powerful guardians of Mount Celestia to aid heroes and soldiers in times of greatest need. The Exchequer of Souls is on the first terrace, where a tally of the virtues and glorious deeds of every archon is kept. At the peak of the Ziggurat City is the Bridge of Al-Sahal, the gateway to the seventh heaven, though, as you might expect, this is one gateway that's particularly hard to gain access to. As far as I can tell, there aren't any gods that make their home in the sixth heaven. The seventh layer is Cronius, or Cronius, the illuminated heaven. It is the highest height of goodness and law. Its light permeates through each layer's fog, visible even in Lunia. The tales of this layer are only speculation, as Zafkiel is the only entity known to have entered it and returned. They say that this layer glows with the force of goodness and law so intensely that it burns out all indifference and evil. It's said that those who are granted access merge with the very essence of Mount Celestia. There may be gods on this layer. There may be features of such astounding beauty that it would set your mind at ease just to know of them. But unfortunately, whatever features this layer has are only for those who ascend to know. And that's about all there is to know about Mount Celestia. Well, it's not all there is to know. There are all sorts of little details I left out, things that I didn't deem important or interesting enough to include. If you want to learn a bit more, then I recommend reading the Mount Celestia section of the Plains of Law book. Physical copies of the book are rare, as it's been out of print for over 20 years, but it's easy enough to find PDFs of really all D&D books online. For my next video, I'm thinking of doing A Guide to the Abyss, as I've noticed several people in my comments asking for it. But if there's a particular plane or topic that you want me to cover next, please let me know down in the comments. And it doesn't have to be an outer plane either. For instance, I haven't yet made a video about the astral plane or the ethereal plane. And it doesn't even have to be about a plane. Also, if you've been enjoying my Planescape videos and you'd like to help me make more, then consider supporting me on Patreon. But whether you do or don't, thank you very much for watching.